What's up guys? Um, so from now on the video is going to get sort of that little intro that I put on this one. Um, I sort of kept a bit of a gap between uh, videos um, so that there's a distinctive phases instead of it all just being one sort of big long continuous streak. Um, I'm going to be trying to get all of the phase two ones done before they're all sort of overdue. Um, so yeah, should get sort of one every couple of days for the next few weeks um, up until when the Ant-Man one's supposed to be due by. Um, and then we'll start looking at the phase three ones. Um, so obviously this one's for uh, Iron Man 3, so let's get straight into it. Um, the opening line about we create our own demons could be paraphrasing um, Oscar Wilde. His line was from memory. Um, we are each our own devil and make this world our hell. Um, could be referring to that, in which case it's an Oscar Wilde um, thing, because he does say a famous man once said. So that could be what he's referring to with that. And then the demon part in the in what he says could just be um, a reference to the demon in a bottle storyline, um, which is one of sort of the greatest uh, Iron Man storylines um, and has arced through all three films. Um, the, the shot that we get at the same time shows three of the suits exploding and going from left to right when you're looking at them on screen. You have the suitcase um, armor, which many believed was the Silver Centurion armor, since it looked a lot like the Silver Centurion armor from the comics. Um, but if you actually go and look up the suits, um, all the different marks up to Mark 42, one of them is called the Silver Centurion, and it's not the suitcase armor. So this is just the suitcase armor. Um, you've then got the one with the vibranium arc, um, as I said in Iron Man 2 one, I don't believe it's vibranium. I believe it's a synthetic version of the Tesseract, um, which is why the staff didn't work on him in Avengers. But I think officially they're just calling it a vibranium arc. Um, but that one's notable from the V-shaped triangular um, 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 chest piece. And then the last one is the Mark Seven Rapid Deployment Suit. Um, we then get the flashback to the um, the conference in Bern, um, and the song there is Eiffel Sixty Five song Blue, uh, which was released in, end of ninety eight, beginning in ninety nine, somewhere around there. Um, some sources that I looked at said it was 98, some sources that I looked at said it was 99, so probably somewhere in between. Um, which means that it would still have been popular come beginning of 2000. Um, and it could speak to Tony's overall emotional um, reaction to having to dredge up these old memories. Um, there is a Pulp Fiction reference in the styling of um, Happy in this sort of flashback scene, um, complete with the, the, the suit and the long sort of mullet. Um, he looks like John Travolta's character from Pulp Fiction. Um, this is where Tony first meets Ho Yinsen, um, who is the guy who eventually saves his life by giving him the electromagnet in his chest um, and helps him develop the first Iron Man suit in the beginning of the first movie. Um, we also get introduced to an original character for the movie who then made his way into the comics called Dr. Wu. He was named after a Steely Dan song and is the guy who performs the heart surgery at the end of the film. Um, we also meet Aldrich Killian and I have his business card as part of the um, additional sort of extra stuff that I got with the box set. Um, so that's that, and obviously AIM as well. Uh, in the comics, 
Aldrich Killian has nothing to do with AIM. Um, but he is from the extremist storyline, which is what this follows. Um, Maya Hansen as well is from the um, extremist storyline, and we meet her in that scene as well. Um, and she's named, she, she, she's sort of named when Aldrich says Miss Hansen. Um, so from that point on, fans sort of knew who the character was. Um, AIM in the comics does mean advanced idea mechanics as it does in the film. However, in the comics, it is a sort of branch of, um, it's a branch of Hydra that develops weapons and stuff that eventually breaks off into its own thing. And they generally wear hazmat suits that look like they have bucket heads. Um, and I'll put a little slide of that for you right here. So in the um, scene where they're, it's you know, sort of in the bedroom and then the plant explodes and Happy tackles Tony, um, when he gets up, he asks Tony, so it's not Y2K? Um, a lot of younger people, I guess, might not know this, but Y2K was a generally uh, sort of believed conspiracy theory that when all the clocks and stuff on computers reached zeros pretty much across the board um, for obviously for midnight on the year 2000 there'd be a lot of zeros uh, in the time that the computers would either shut themselves down or explode as the um, plant exploded um, so that's just going to show you how far some people went um, in in um, uh, um, in trying to, I mean, in believing, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. That, that, that it was very widely believed. Uh, so that's what the Y2K thing was. This on his, this is actually Robert Downey Jr.'s Twitter bio. If you go and look it up, um, I'll put a screenshot of it for you when I finish explaining. But when you go, if you go and look at it, it actually says that on his Twitter bio. Um, and that's sort of how he tells Maya um, that, you know, she knows who wrote the formula, that it is that she needs to fix extras. Um, so, yeah. There is a line, um, when we come back to the present day, uh, where uh, Tony says he did a, a brief soiree in an Afghan cave, which is obviously um, the a reference to how he got the Iron Man suit and invented the Iron Man suit when he was kidnapped by the Ten Rings. Um, and he's creating the Mark 42 armor at that time, which is the one that has the prehensile repulsion system and you can sort of bring each piece to him sort of individually. Um, the 42 could be a reference to um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in which the number 42 is the answer to the question, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Um, and then, of course, when uh, Tony says, Jarvis dropped my needle, it starts playing a Christmas song, uh, a, a jazzed-up version of... I can't remember what, what song it is, to be honest. Um, but I, I do know that it is a Christmas song. Um, I think it might be Jingle Bells, now that I think about it. Um, but it's a it's sort of a jazzy version of it. Uh, and this is where we get um, Shane Black's trademarked uh, Christmas backdrop for most of his films. Um, and it's sort of interesting to note as well that Robert Downey Jr. and Shane Black have worked together on other projects as well. Um, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is the one that I can think of, um, and it was also um, set with a backdrop of Christmas. Um, in the background of this sort of scene in the garage, um, sort of in the back of the shot, there is a twisted metal thing just sitting there. Um, that's the car from Monaco. 
um, which is where he fought uh, Whiplash for the first time in that Silver Centurion armor that I was talking about before with the suitcase armor. Um, he then goes and turns on the TV, and the first thing we see um, over the top of a sort of test screen thing uh, is the Ten Rings. Um, this is a temporary tattoo, and I obviously don't want to put it on because it's going to just fade away. Um, but we get, we get the Ten Rings there, um, and we then get to see um, the first glimpse of the Mandarin um, as he's walking away, and we get to see that he has a tattoo on the back of his neck of the Captain America shield with the star in the center of it replaced with an Anarchy A um, in his sort of symbolic way that he is throwing everything that America stands for, sort of turning it upside down sort of thing. Um, President Ellis, who is referred to in this sort of propaganda film, um, was named for Warren Ellis, who I can't remember if he was a writer or an artist. I think he was a writer. Regardless, he worked on the extremist story that this movie was based on. Um, we then get to see the Iron Patriot suit, which I will put an image of uh, in, in this video as well. Uh, it first appeared um, in a, a, as a Dark Avengers character, and it was Norman Osborn who first wore it in the comics. It was never a version of um, the War Machine armor. Alright, so it's worth noticing uh, at this point that um, the story that I have here um, of the Five Nightmares story, there's the actual title card there, Five Nightmares, um, has some similarities to the film, whether that's because they were working on it at the time or it's one of the ones that they took, um, that they took inspiration from, I forgot the word for a second there, um, yeah, so uh, the, the, the similarities that I can see are in this story. The villain takes some Stark tech, as you can see they've got arc reactors in their chest, turns them into living bombs um, that don't give any casings in the film. Instead of being arc reactors and natural technology in their bodies, it's just Tony Stark's extremist program. Um, there is a, uh, a a villain who is trying to get revenge for a, a, a past action of Tony's. Uh, in this, it's um, t um, the death of Obadiah Stane um, and it's his son that's trying to get revenge, believing Tony to be responsible. Uh, and in the film, it's Aldrich Killian trying to get revenge for uh, leaving him on the roof. Um, and, yeah. Um, also, at one point here, um, Tony, see if I can find it really quickly, Tony is sort of left stranded and none of his Avenger friends want to help out um, in a similar way to how Tony has to sort of come up with his own way out of things in the film after Jarvis sort of shuts down. Um, in the coffee shop, um, Rhodey is talking to Tony and um, he... The, there's, a, there's a line that comes up where Tony says that Einstein slept for three hours out of the year, um, which is just an urban legend. Um, oh, well, it, actually, that's false. It's an outright sort of fabrication, but it's based on an urban legend. That is that geniuses have a higher tendency to be insomniacs and therefore don't sleep as much. Um, some examples are Nikola Tesla, the inventor, 
um, and the artist uh, Vincent van Gogh. Um, and so all he's trying to say there is, I'm a genius, I don't sleep really well. Um, and trying to sort of at the same time avoid the fact that he's suffering from anxiety. Um, we also get a very um, vague sort of reference to a Big Bang Theory episode. Um, one particular conversation in that episode um, when Rhodey quickly adds Tater onto the end of Dick to make the word Dictator as some little kids turn up. Um, in the Big Bang Theory Season 3 Episode 1, um, the guys come back from a trip to the, I believe it was the North Pole, South Pole, one of those, and they are talking about having fabricated some results, um, and Howard and Rush are sitting down with Sheldon to tell him this, and Howard calls Sheldon a dictator, Raj pulls him up, says, I thought we were going easy on him, and then it's where Howard says, that's why I added the tater. Um, you can find it quite easily on YouTube. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Um, but, yeah, I just thought that was a pretty cool little reference there. And, of course, those guys are, are scientists themselves and comic nerds and stuff, so that's the connection there, too. Um, we then have... Um, Ralphie from The Christmas Story, who is played by Peter Billingsley, um, who is the producer of the Iron Man films and also appeared as the scientist that gets yelled at by Obadiah Stane in the first film. Um, I'll put a little shot of him from Christmas Story now. Uh, it's also worth noting in this film that Happy and Pepper sort of uh, interact with each other in a particular sort of manner. Um, this is because in the comics they were married at one time, uh, and it's supposed to be some sort of a, a vague reference to how they interact with each other there for that. Um, there's also a very sort of brief, very brief cameo from another character from the comics who was one of Tony Stark's um, assistants or secretaries. Uh, her name is Bambi Abergast, and she is sort of mentioned by name by Happy uh, before the meeting with Killian. Um, during which um, Happy is having a conversation with uh, Tony um, and he says, Do you know how people reacted when I told them I was Iron Man's bodyguard? Now, in the comics, um, there is one point where Happy actually dons a um, Iron Man suit. Uh, that's him in the forefront there um, as part of the Iron Legion, which also makes an appearance in this film. Happy also makes um, a reference to the Super Friends, which, as you can see, is a DC Comics um, TV show from, I believe, the 70s, um, when he says, I don't see you anymore, you're hanging out with the Super Friends. Uh, we also get a, um introduction to the character of Jack Taggart um, in the scene um, at the Chinese theatre. Uh, he's the one that receives the extremist stuff uh, and consequently explodes. Uh, in the comics, he was a villain known as Firepower. Um, we also get an introduction to Eric Savin, uh, who in the comics was also a, a small-time uh, villain, one of the sort of B-list ones um, that they just sort of can make a reference to because he's not sort of big enough to be a villain all on his own. Um, but in the comics, he was a character called Cold Blood 7, um, and I believe he was some sort of a mercenary or something. Um, but, yeah, that's what Eric Savin's position is. He's the guy who walks away at the end from the Chinese theatre. Um, the Downton Abbey scene that's shown on the TV screen in the hospital, um, the male character on that, Tom Branson, uh, is also a chauffeur um, who falls in love with a woman above his station. 
which he mirrors the relationship between Happy, who is Tony Stark's chauffeur, and he's sort of in love with Pepper, who is the CEO of Stark Industries. Um, we then get our number 12, um, when um, Maya Hansen arrives and Tony says, please tell me there's not a 12 year old kid waiting out in the car for me. She jokingly says he's 13, um, but that is still our number 12 reference. Uh, and then we get a rescue, um, I've lost the word completely. Um, but yeah, we get, we get a the closest on screen representation of the rescue armor. Um, now for those of you that don't know, rescue is the armor that Pepper Potts wears when she takes over and sort of becomes a version of Iron Man herself. Um, and I believe she has a similar thing to Tony where she has to have the arc reactor implanted in her chest as well. I could be wrong there though. Now, if you remember um, from the very first Iron Man film um, and the Easter eggs that were in that, uh, I told you about a photo that had sort of caused a bit of a lawsuit um, because they used it without sort of asking the photographer if they could use it. Um, that photo makes another appearance and that photo is this one um, the leaked Iron Man photo um, from the set um, it makes another appearance it's on a newspaper in Harley Keener's garage um, when Tony gets there he's sort of flipping through the paper and that photo is on the cover again um, if you don't believe me, you can go back and watch that scene. I guarantee you it's there. Um, we also get told that Iron Man is the mechanic. Um, I could be completely wrong and just clutching at straws here, but the mechanic is also an action film starring Jason Statham. Um, and the fact that he calls himself the mechanic and then goes and tries to infiltrate the Mandarin's castle lair um some possible similarities could be made um i can't say too much more about that it's more or less just the the, the fact that he calls himself the mechanic instead of say an engineer or whatever um i haven't seen the mechanic myself um so i can't say if there's any other similarities there um the retro reflective panels that Harley Keener suggests for the Iron Man suit um, are the exact same panels that were used on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier when they disappeared um, and turned him sort of invisible there. Um, and if you believe the um, Iron Legion log that they have, there is already one there that can sort of camouflage. So not having a retroflective panels one, when you have one that can sort of camouflage into its surroundings, seems like it's either already been done or it hasn't. Um, so it's a bit ambiguous there as to whether or not he's actually made one. Um, the armor is called Sneaky, if you want to look for it online. Um, all right, so there are some similarities between Harley Keener, the kid that allows Tony to set up shop in his garage, and Sam Alexander, who is the current um, civilian alias of the hero Nova. Um, the Nova Corps, obviously, is Marvel's version of the Green Lantern Corps. Um, now, the similarities between these kids are that they both have a father who has gone, he's not around, um, and has a they both have a mother who is always working and not really there for them. Um, and they're both sort of very brave characters, with Harley um, going in sort of alone against some adults with superpowers um, with only his flare canister for protection um, 
is looking at an article here at the moment um, that says, this, this is what it says about Sam. Uh, Sam is a kid whose father goes missing while he is young and whose mother is always working and never really there much for him. However, soon he learns that his father's old stories about being a superhero were true and that his father used to be a member of the Nova Corps um, and then Rocket Raccoon and Gamora show up looking for him. Um, now, the the theory here is that Harley Keener, which is the name of the kid in the movie, uh, Keener could just be his mother's maiden name and Harley could be his middle name and therefore Harley Keener is not actually his name at all. Um, but that it's Sam Harley Alexander, um, which is sort of possible. Um, if his mother's raising him, they'd just be the Keeners, um, and he may prefer to just be called Harley. Um, obviously, from looking in his garage and the fact that he um, is a fan of Iron Man, he's very interested in uh, engineering and robotics and stuff, and... Harleys are a type of motorbike, so there could be some sort of a connection there to that. Um, but if this theory is true, then it's entirely possible that um, come uh, Infinity War, when the Guardians show up on Earth, that they may um, come across Harley, who I believe has a confirmed role in Avengers 4 anyway so they may come across him uh inform him that his father is actually a part of the nova corps um and then they could take harley on as the new nova sam alexander um i just thought that that theory was um uh, cool um and it sort of gets me excited because i really want to see nova in the mcu um and so yeah I added that in because I personally love that theory. The next reference is to this woman whose name is Ellen Brandt, which we can find out from this uh, screenshot here. Uh, and she is a character from the Man-Thing comics. She's the wife of Ted Salas who becomes Man-Thing. Um, in the film, she even has the scarring that she got when she was burnt by... Man Thing's powers when they first manifested. Our next reference is between Seven and Yul Brynner's uh, Gunslinger from the Westworld movie from the 70s, I think. Um, the relation there is that they look similar, like the, their facial features look similar, um, and in the fight scene at Rose Hill, um, Seven even ends up with a gouge across his face, similar to um, an artwork of Yul Brynner's Gunslinger. Um, so our next one uh, is the Roxxon Oil Corporation, uh, which technically makes two appearances, but I'm separating them because the second one um, is relating to something else. Um, this one is the, the company is mentioned when... Uh, the Mandarin told him to go into the accountant's head, um, who he ends up shooting on live television. Um, Stanley then gets his cameo as a judge for the Miss Chattanooga pageant. Um, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. If you're if you are like Tony and are wondering what happened to the first mouse, it was killed by the mouse trap when it was trying to get the cheese. The second mouse is then able to come along and take it. Um, this saying is supposed to mean, um, or, or is supposed to show the, the different ways that you can uh, sort of achieve success in um, business. And that is that you can either be the first in on an opportunity and therefore be able to claim whatever you'd like, um, or be ready to sort of swoop in when things start to go badly for someone else and sort of help pick that up um at least that's my understanding of it uh, if you make some other understanding of it please leave it in the um, comments down below i'd love to hear it um the sir lawrence oblivier um 
name that Tony calls Trevor when he's talking to, I believe it's Killian. Um, uh, he calls him Sir Lawrence Oblivier. Um, this is both a reference and a bit of a parody, I guess. Um, Sir Lawrence Olivier was a very well-known uh, English actor, like Trevor Slattery is, um, with the obvious changing slightly of his last name to Olivier instead of Olivier, um, and that is to sort of chuck in the word um, for like Oblivion and Olivier, which if you watch Harry Potter is the memory spell. Um, so basically what Tony's saying here is that he's an English actor who doesn't remember anything about anything. Um, the a Toast of Croydon, the, the line about um, Trevor's King Lee, um, is um, the uh, Croydon is a town that was about, I think it was about 20 miles outside of one of the producer's hometowns or one of the writer's hometowns or something like that. Um, there's the Thor reference when um, Killian is talking about the, when the guy with the hammer came out of the sky. Um, subtleties, well, si since the guy with the hammer fell out of the sky, subtleties had it today, um, is the actual line. Um, the guy that says these guys are so weird and sort of runs away at the end of the gunfight um, is actually, that line was improvised, sort of come up with by the stuntman Eric Oram, who also worked with um, Robert Downey Jr. on the Sherlock's Home, Sherlock Holmes movies. Um, we then go into the main house, where Tony continues to name call Trevor. He calls him Meryl Streep, who we all know is an amazing actress, um, and he calls him Ringo who is one of the Beatles and therefore another famous English person that everybody should know. Um, so, yeah. We then get to see the MCU's version of the Hall of Armors, which as you can see in this image, is sort of the big silo thing underneath um, sort of the foundations of Tony Stark's um, mansion, where he keeps all of his Iron Man suits. Uh, this is also a um, location from the comics, um, because obviously Tony Stark has a lot of different armors in the comics as well. When Killian is talking to President Ellis um, about the ship that they're on, the rocks on Norco, um, Killian makes reference to um, a time when that ship accidentally spilled crude oil into the, I think he says the Pacific, um, and that because of legislation or whatever, nobody saw a day in court or something, something to that effect. Um, that is referencing the BP oil spill, um, which was also, I believe, in the Pacific, uh, and it was really bad. Um, it, was a, it was a little while ago, um, obviously, if they're making a reference to it in 2013, when this film was released, um, it was sort of a pressing matter at the time, and so obviously that this is the way that art is imitating life. Um, but yeah, that's that's what that reference is to. Um, the Igor armor, which a lot of people think looks like the Hulkbuster suit from the comics, um, while they are not technically wrong, when everyone says that that is at the time when everyone thought that that was the Hulkbuster suit, they were incorrect. Igor is named after the hunchback assistant of Dr. Frankenstein. Um, so that's why he sort of has the little hunchback thing and he's able to hold up the rest of the crane just with his own body. Um, the other two armors that are name dropped here are the Heartbreaker armor um, it is named for the massive um, arc reactor port on the chest piece um, and Red Snapper, who has two sort of extendable um, claw-like um, 
fittings on its arms the same as a red snapper lobster. Um, there are others that make an appearance um, like the bones suit, which is the one that breaks apart and knocks out three different guys by itself. Um, I think the sneaky one makes an appearance. Silver Centurion, I think at some point, makes its appearance as well. Um, there's an article somewhere online that details them all if you're interested. Um, I'll try and find it and link it in the description. Um, but no promises. Um, we then get the... Um, for all of the Phase 2 films, there is a running sort of reference um, where Marvel basically tried to see how many people's hands they could take away. Um, hands or arms. Um, so anything from the shoulder down was fair game. Um, and that was for um, a reference to the second part of the original um, Star Wars trilogy where Luke lost his hand fighting Darth Vader. In this film, it is Aldrich Killian and he loses it when Tony has some spike come out of his suit of armour. Um, right as Killian's trying to punch him and he cuts his arm off and it sort of melts through the floor and causes all sorts of destruction. Um, and is eventually the cause for why Pepper falls sort of to her death. Um, the dragon tattoos on Killian's chest could be a reference to one of two things. Um, I'll say the more likely one at first, and that is Fing Fang Foom. Um, he was seen in a billboard in the first Iron Man film. Um, he's, um, he's the alien species that is in the comics, the one that brings the Ten Rings of Power that the Mandarin uses. Um, so he's got a Ten Rings reference there as well, which obviously um, Killian's been working with them. Um, so that's the more likely one. The less likely one is that it's um, the dragon Shao Lao the Undying, which if you've seen Iron Fist, you'll know is in that film, uh, that show. My head's all over the place. It's in that show. Um, and it's supposed to be a dragon that doesn't die and is protecting something or attacking something, I can't remember. Um, and the reason I say that it could be that is because, uh, Extremis is able to completely regrow entire limbs. Like, the, the amputees are the ones that, um, Killian gives it to, the army amputees, um, Ellen Brandt, we actually get to see a shot of her regrowing her entire arm with Extremis. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it kind of seems like with a regeneration ability like that, you'd be incredibly hard to kill, almost undying. And with the dragon tattoos being a reference, it's possible. It's unlikely because it's in Iron Fist, as I said, but it is possible. Um, Tony then says the prodigal son returns when the Mark 42 flies in. Um, that is obviously a reference to the biblical story of the prodigal son. Um, for some weird reason, when I was looking up the different references and stuff in this film, um, the prodigal son reference had completely gone over a lot of people's heads and that confused me because it's like one of the more well-known um, Bible stories, um, and then right at the end we get to see who Tony has been narrating this to the entire time, which is Dr. Bruce Banner. Um, this sort of feels, A, like something Tony would actually do, um, because Bruce is a doctor, and Tony would just be like, oh, you're a doctor, cool, I gotta tell you something, and start going off about that. Um, but at the same time, wouldn't Bruce, with all of his intellect and his contacts and stuff, have told Tony about Leonard Sampson? Like, I, I know that it's just supposed to be funny that Tony's mistaken what Bruce's doctorate is in, but wouldn't Bruce have, like, been like, I, I know a shrink, if you want a shrink, I can hook you up send a text or an email or whatever, um, but, yeah, 
um, some after so, some deleted scene um, references in one of the um, sort of news footage things of the Iron Patriot when it's first announced. One of the guys says um, that the only reason he thinks it's called the Iron Patriot is because Captain America was already taken. Um, and at the end of his segment, he says that he's just thankful that this time it wasn't aliens. Um, obviously, we have the Captain America reference there, and then one to the Avengers where the aliens came out of a hole in space. Um, in one of the other deleted scenes... I believe it's Tony says that something is as dumb as a bag of hammers. Um, either this is a reference to Thor because he has a hammer or it's a reference and this is the more likely one to Justin Hammer um, who we all know is dumb but think, but you know rich and thinks he can do the, what Tony does. Um, and I, I believe it's Tony that says it, so it makes more sense that it would be Justin Hammer. Um, one of the other scenes also tells us what happened to Maya Hansen. Um, unless you'd completely missed it, Maya got shot by a Killian in the film. And then the next scene in that same location, she's just not there at all. Uh, it turns out that Killian hooked up some extremist to one of the plants that's sitting on the table sort of in the middle of the room there puts it up on a step and as Maya's crawling towards it to try and stop it from exploding she gets too close and when it explodes it turns her into a shadow on the wall uh, and the last one is when Seven is in the Patriot armor on the plane he's sitting down sort of waiting for his cue to start going in and killing people um, and some Chatty Cathy comes up and starts talking to him, um, trying to get him to talk, believing that he's Rhodey, of course. Um, and then, in order to get him to shut up, Seven says, hey, is that Thor? And then gives him a good old elbow to the face. Um, so, yeah, that's all for the Iron Man 3 Easter eggs. Um, that was a lot, I know. Um, it's taken me a while to get together the, the pictures and sort out the order of things chronologically. Um, but yeah, we finally did it. Um, the one shot on the Iron Man 3 DVD release is the Agent Carter one. Um, it has a maximum of five, technically. Um, so I'll quickly run through those. The first one is on the little sheets that they're writing how many agents and stuff on. Um, and you get just help, you get a really good look at it when Peggy's writing down on it. Um, it has a big red stamp across it that says Zodiac. Uh, Zodiac is a group of 12 villains, 12 very B-grade villains from the comics um, who are named after the astrological signs like Aries and Cancer and Capricorn, um, they have very lame powers, um, we then get to later on, on the actual vial that she finds, there's a little symbol on it, that is the exact same shape as the Zodiac Key, which is an item from the comics, I can't remember what it does, um, but it's like the Zodiac's whole reason for being, um, in the phone call with Tony Stark, uh, with Howard Stark, rather, in the phone call with Howard Stark and the guy that sort of is running the agency at the time, um, Howard says she's going to tell her she's going to be running S.H.I.E.L.D. with Phillips and me or something like, like that. Um, Phillips is Colonel Chester Phillips, who was played by Tommy Lee Jones in the Captain America film. Uh, obviously, she's going to be running S.H.I.E.L.D., so this is the formation of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, which we know to be true from um, from Winter Soldier and from Ant-Man as well, the little flashback scene at the beginning of that one. Um, and then right at the end, we get to see a very brief cameo from um, Neil Mandanu's Dum Dum Dugan. And that's it. That's all of the references on the Iron Man 3 DVD. 
Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave me a comment down in the comment section there. Um, if there's anything I missed or if you like the theories or anything else that was divulged in this video. Um, and until next time, guys, get raised in hell.